My name is Ray Beyer. I currently reside in uh, Pasadena, Texas. Lived there for approximately 35 years. Um, I was born in a small East Texas town of Woodville, Texas. It's currently located in between Livingston and Jasper on Highway 90. The railroad that I grew up in that area watching was at uh, the TNO, Texas and New Orleans, and it was part of the Pupwood Triangle. That's what got my interest as a kid seeing these big monsters going down the track. My interest in uh, model trains or trains themselves is just the magnitude of the, the, uh, the engine and the cars. How, how does 140,000 pounds of commodities ride on a small area of surface on the rail? The engineering that went into this, the, the design of this, then trying to mimic real life into the model trains. Like I said, I grew up in East Texas watching the real life. Uh, I had a, as a child, uh, I had my first Chattanooga Choo Choo uh, when I was probably about nine or 10, set up on my bedroom floor. Me and my dad uh, put it together and I watched it. My dad worked for the railroad. Uh, he worked for TNO for 41 years until he retired from there. Once I was in school and went to college a little bit, I kind of lost interest in model trains, found cars and, and uh, girls. And uh, when I got married and started my own family, my wife came up with wanting a train around a Christmas tree. And if you ask her, that's how I got started back heavily back into model trains. She would definitely say it's all because of her. I've probably been building model trains most of my life. I, like I said, when I was younger, I had a layout, so I had to build my little buildings and stuff. Uh, when I got older, I started building more scenes, doing scenery work, building mountains, uh, snow scenes, stuff like that uh, for around the Christmas tree. And then I got involved with several of the clubs modular clubs. One of the clubs I belong to currently is uh, BARF. Uh, it's Bay Area Railroading Fellowship. Um, I've been I've been a member of that club probably since 1986, 85. Uh, met a bunch of great people in the organization. Uh, became good lifelong friends with most of them. Uh, and then I joined the San Jack Model Railroad Club met more people and that's where I started gaining uh, my experience in the hobby, learning from other people. Currently I'm the vice president for the Long Star region of the NMRA. I'm also to the contest co-chair of the contest, model contest that we have at our annual conventions. So I get to do clinics and help people along. You meet people, you learn skill sets, but also too, you'll meet people that's having a problem and you go, wait a minute, I know I, I this is how I fixed mine. And then they go, you fixed, you fixed yours by doing this way? Yeah. And you start learning experience and you start sharing it, your experience that you didn't think that you had. As people uh, come up to you and they'll say, oh, you helped uh, this person do this on their layout. Yeah can you help me do this? Well, I can show you how to do this, kind of teach you, but if, if I do this for you, then it becomes my layout. It doesn't become your layout. The community is, a uh, model railroad community is a very fascinating group of people because you have people who are interested in the one-to-one -one scale, which is the only thing they like to do is take photos and videos of the prototype. Uh, some people like uh, building and recreating a scene from their childhood. A lot of the older generation, they like steam engines. Uh, steam engines to them is a living, breathing organi uh, organism. Uh, it has a mind of its own. If you talk to any live steamer or a actual steam uh, engine engineer, or a fireman on a steam train, 
like the uh, Durango and the Cumbries and Toltecs and stuff like that. They will tell you that the beast is alive. It will tell you what the beast wants, and if you don't give the beast what it wants, it will fight you. That is true in the hobby when you start building your layout. You can only do certain things that the layout will allow you to do and your wife because you have to negotiate a the room to build a layout in your home. It is both. It is an art and it is a hobby. The art, uh, the art part of the modeling is trying to make something that looks real that is not real to imitate it. When you're building your layout, and you're trying to build a mountain. Most people get hung up on the phrase, well, how do I build a mountain? Well, you take everything that doesn't look like a mountain away from the layout. You, know, you carve, hack, paint, smear plaster on it to get it to what you think it looks like. And as long as you think it's good, then you're happy with it, then it's great. The hobby part of this is a lot of people get into it. Uh, it's their way of decompressing from the world. They uh, go into the hob, into their little train room, into the little world or the, the universe that they're working on. And next thing you know, they go in at five o'clock. Their wife is beating on the door. Hey, it's eleven o'clock at night. Are you gonna come home? Uh, are you gonna come in and go to bed? There's that aspect of it. I mean, people will get lost for hours in it. And when they start showing their their layouts out off to the public, then you see the pride that comes up and then they become the teacher because now they're answering questions from other people who don't know, well, how'd you do this? Well, this is how I did it. It is hard to stop. It's like restoring a 1965 Camaro. Uh, once you get bit by the car bug, and I'm going to say once you get bit by the model train bug, you're, it's for life. It, can, it will consume you. Uh, and in, in a good way, what I mean by consuming, because that's what you enjoy doing. If you enjoy doing something, then it's not really a job. It's something that you like doing. It's like gardening. You know, there's people that can go out there and weed for hours. I go out there and look at the yard. Go, I got to cut the yard again. It all depends on what you're trying to get from it. But yes, it is an art and it is a hobby. So it encompasses young and old. I've been involved with the Galveston Railroad Museum, oh, off and on for about 20, 20 years, 30 years. I got involved with one of the local uh, hobby stores that was asked to come down here and build a layout. Uh, it was a computer generated DCC, digital command control layout run by a computer so it would run trains, cycle trains, stuff like that. I'm going to say the model railroad community of Houston helped build that layout. Uh, the uh, layout was built by a bunch of novice, master model built railroaders, uh, people who liked the hobby, people who were just getting into the hobby. This The train store at the time was the uh, Houston uh, train seller. Source, Houston Train Source. And uh, they asked the community to build buildings for the layout down here in Galveston. So everybody in the community, the railroad model community, helped build models. Well, since I was in between employment at the time, they asked me if I'd come down here and help them uh, construct the layout. So me and a gentleman named David Ray, Rennie Goyer, and Zoe, I don't know what her last name was, um, she, uh, we built the bench work. We did the all the the foam construction, uh, the plaster cloth building, built mountains and buildings and streets, setting the scenes, all that. There was a few gentlemen from the north side of Houston that did the computer interaction between the layout of the trains and thing. And that people would come and push a button, and that's what would activate the trains and it would run through a cycle. Uh, worked on that layout to its completion, and then Ike came uh, to Galveston and basically de destroyed the layout. And then uh, 
got involved with the museum again when they uh, picked up Grandpa's layout, which is, as you can see behind me, this is part of Grandpa's layout. Asked if I would help come down and try to get it back up and running because the gentleman that they hired at the time didn't quite work out. So I started working on Grandpa's layout here, getting it back under construction. Uh, and also, too, they asked me if I'd take care of the O scale uh, layout, which I did. got it up and running, started getting animation put back onto it. On the HO layout, uh, Grandpa's layout, we started putting more lights, more detail parts, and stuff like that. Right before COVID, the uh, the termite, the Galveston Railroad Museum had a nice termite festival here in the building. Uh, the termites were having a nice big party with all the wood, but luckily they didn't start eating any of the two layouts. So we took the layouts out uh, for termite uh, mitigation and um, now we're back of putting the layouts back together. We're gonna put back Grandpa's layout and hopefully in the future we'll be putting the O-scale layout back in. But that's for the museum to, to uh, think about. Model train building requires a skill set. The skill set is you have to love or like what you're doing. If you don't like what you're doing, then you're not going to stay with the hobby. And as you start building stuff, you start learning stuff, you start know uh, like how to pour water. There's there's classes, there's YouTube videos, there are people tell you why well, I'm using Virotech or I use liquid water from Woodland Scenics. Uh, but how do you highlight it? So you just got to play with, it. that's where the skills come in. Um, if you're, in uh, like in school, like high school or uh, intermediate or even uh, elementary, um, you start learning how to assemble things, They're how to follow instructions. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of adults have a hard time reading and following instructions. You will start developing skills that you didn't think that you had, such as wiring how to make something move, how to make something animated, how to make something trigger when a train or a person comes in and does something to the layout. How do you get a, a figurine to spin, make it look like it's flying a kite? That's a skill set that you'll learn, but you don't think that you're learning. But then people ask you questions, going, well, how'd you do this? So now you're, now you're telling you how people how you did your skills. How did, you, how did you learn to do this? Well, I just saw a microwave turntable that turned at a certain speed. I go, well, I can make a carousel out of that. That's how I, one gentleman I know to built a carousel for his uh, amusement park, his carnival. It's for everybody. Uh, I know of gentlemen, I know of a gentleman who is blind. Um, he loves trains. Uh, he does, he runs G scale or the garden, what they call garden scale. He cannot see them, but he can hear them. Uh, he has sound in all of his engines. His wife is a gardener, so she takes care of all the the miniature trees and bushes. And uh, so, even disabled people can get into the hobby. You have to learn humility. You have to learn patience because you may not be able to do it a certain way, but with determination, you will find out that you can do it. Also too, you talk to husbands say, well, this, I built this layout, but my wife did all the scenery or she did the placement of the buildings. And you ask the wives, do you like trains? No, I don't like trains. I like doing the scenes. Oh, so you're a closet modeler. And they go, huh? Well. You don't like, well, I don't like the trains, but you like building the build, the scenes, don't you? Yes. Okay. So welcome to the, welcome to the hobby. There is really no different categories of model trains. There are what they called scales. There are probably seven primary scales. And then each one of those scales have offshoots of it. Um, the smallest, scale is T scale. 
basically it's real popular in Japan. It is basically, you can build an entire layout on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. It's run by a nine volt battery. And in Japan, since they do not have a lot of room for major layouts, they will get together and have dinner. And on the table, they will start building a, a T scale layout. The next scale up from that would be Z. Z is real popular in Europe. Uh, it's about the size, okay, T scale is about the size of a two US postal stamps put together. T scale would be a dime, a Z scale would be a quarter, a the N scale would be probably a half of a dollar, HO would be uh, about the size of a dollar, O scale would be about the size of $4, uh, setting not in length, but in a square. Uh, S scale would be in between O, then you have G, and then off of that you have so many other subsuits of different scales. You have what they call narrow gauge, uh, which is uh, in real life, narrow gauges, uh, distance between the rail is three foot. And uh, most modern day trains run on the standard, what they call standard gauge, which is four foot, eight and three quarters between rail. Uh, narrow gauge was built for uh, the mountains or tighter radiuses of curves and stuff like that. It's kind of intense because you're doing something that you have never done before. The intensity is, am I doing this right? Uh, what does other people gonna think? You basically, the intensity is what you put upon yourself. The labor part of it, um, again, you're learning a new skill set. you're learning woodworking, uh, or you may be learning metalworking, because some layouts I've seen that's prone to flooding and stuff like that, or termites, uh, build their layouts out of metal. Their sub base is all out of metal. I don't know if you can say labor intensity, if you love the the hobby or love trains, it's not really an intense labor. It's more of a compassion. My experience so far working with the Galveston River Museum has been relatively well. Uh, they provided all the materials that I need to rebuild the layout. Uh, the project is moving ahead. Uh, Basically, whatever I need, they will try to provide, which is the only thing I can ask for. The layout is going back together relatively smoothly, a lot smoother than what I thought it was going to go. Uh, we are still looking for a few missing items, but I understand there are in storage here at the museum, so we just have to spend some time to go to look for them. But everything relatively right now is going relatively smoothly with no complaints. The current grandpa's layout that I'm currently restoring was uh, belonged to a gentleman in Freeport, Texas. He was a electrical or chemical engineer in Freeport. He basically had it in his uh, house. It was probably, originally it was 12 by 12, I believe is what the room size was. It encompassed the whole entire room. You basically had to crawl in through the door to the bedroom to get into the layout. Uh, when he passed away, um, the family approached the museum, is what I understand, uh, and asked if they could donate the, the layout. The museum hired some uh, model railroaders and contractors to come go to his house and they removed the layout from his house and brought it here and built the first design of the layout to fit this room. They did add, uh, did had to add some pieces, some more bench work to fill in to make it fit the room that we're currently in now. Um, it ran all the way up to about 2021 or 20 when uh, COVID started uh, appearing. Also too, during that time, the museum was battling uh, the termites. Uh, basically, the termites was eating anything that was wood in the building. Luckily, the walls of the building is concrete, 
and uh, after Ike, they put metal two by fours, metal studs in the walls, but the roof was still plywood. So the termites was eating basically the roof. And then, then they were eating the subfloor. Then they started getting eating the paper off the back of the sheetrock. So we had to remove the layout. So we basically dismantled the layout. It was stored uh, for about two and a half to three years. Late last year, beginning of this year, since I worked on the layout in the past uh, at the Galveston train show that the Galveston Museum puts on, I was approached by David Robinson and asked me if I'd be interested in putting the layout back together. I said, well, I haven't seen the layout, don't know where it's at. He said, well, it's in storage. And they, uh, he was going to bring it back to the lay, uh, back to the island from where it was stored at. And if I'd be interested, I said, yeah, I'll be interested in putting it back together. And we are now in the process of rebuilding bench work and remounting the layout. So trains will start to run again on this layout in the future. I don't know the gentleman. There is three photographs on the wall of him at his house with this layout. I do not even know what the gentleman's name is. I've always referred to it uh, when Morris was here as the museum director, he referred to it as grandpa's layout. When the family would come here to view it, and they used to come about every other week to see what was being done to them, to the layout, they would always refer to it as grandpa's layout. I do not know what the gentleman's name is. Uh, it would be nice to know so we can maybe get a plaque or something or identify his name on the photo in the hallway of saying, who is grandpa? Because I do not know who grandpa is. <laughs> really, the layout um, suffered some damage in moving, which most layouts will as you move it from one location to another. Uh, severity, not too bad. Uh, most of the decking and scenery is and still in good plan, just minor track repairs, some scenery repairs. Um, the, the bench work that was originally underneath the layout that was put in by the other contractors was not really stable. That's one thing I was constantly fighting with at with before teardown was that the bench work would move. Uh, it was not beefy enough to hold the weight, the moisture content in the room would make the layout grow and shrink. So that would raise havoc, but the layout was in fairly good shape and still is. Basically, once the project's uh, completed and operational, it's going to be, be basically viewed from the other side of the glass. Hopefully there will be some platforms or something like that to so to raise the height for younger generations or kids and stuff, or uh, handicap to uh, easily view the layout. It's not gonna be too much of an interactive layout uh, that may eventually evolve, but right now it's basically gonna be trains moving, gonna be movement. Uh, there'll be some animation on the layout, but basically for the beginning, it's gonna be a viewing, uh, layout. Good age for to introduce children or kids to model railroading. Any age is really good. Um, my granddaughter started out with a wooden brio table uh, that I found on the side of the road at a doctor's office and he was getting rid of it and I took it home and my little granddaughter uh, fell in love with trains at that age. She was probably three a repair work at a local hobby store in the Houston area. And uh, I've seen children come in at as young as one, teething on a plastic train, a uh, teething car. I think it's made by Playmobil or something like that. It's in the shape of a train. Um, I've seen children five and six can operate model trains better than some adults. So the age is whatever the level of the child's attendance, attendance is. Uh, how well do they have hand and eye coordination? Um, are they rough with their trains? Because if they're rough with the trains, then you may go up to a different scale that can handle the abuse. 
uh, do they really find the trains interesting? Because I know some people, they think, oh, my, tr my child loves trains and the child has no desire to even look or play with one. Well, currently right now I know of a five-year-old who can basically tell you every class of UP diesel engines in the UP roster. Uh, he likes playing with trains. He has his own O-scale train set. Uh, he plays with it. He takes very good care of it. When he brings it in for service, he'll tell me exactly what it needs to be done. And he's only five to six years old. I have a couple of adults that should not be in trains because <laughs> um, they basically buy a train and two days later they're back in the store. Hey, it quit working. Uh, so age is not relative, relative to the hobby. It's how attentive, how their skill set is, uh, that patience, 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 patience. A good starter set for kids, and I say with kids easily, lightly, um, because we're all kids no matter what the age we are, is uh, the wooden brios, uh, Lionel, and the G-Scale Playmobil. Uh, type of trains. Those are great for kids up to 10, 11, 12 until they start finding what how, what scale they want to model in. As you get older, you have different interests, you get married, you have other people involved in your hobby. So you have to negotiate how much room you can do for a train and then that would determine on what size scale of train that you can accommodate. Adults and kids will learn as patience, um, the art of negotiations, because uh, you, if you go to a train show, you have to be able to interact with a person that you want to buy something from. So you have to learn what's well, an used item. You have to learn to negotiate a better price than what the person is asking. Kids are real good about negotiations. Uh, they can walk up to you and uh, say, uh, I'd like to buy this. Can you sell it to me? Yeah, okay. But I don't think you can afford it. And they'll look up at you with those puppy dog eyes and here, kid, take it, go. Well, some adults actually learn about family interactions because um, they start interacting with their kids more. Uh, their wives even will uh, interact with their husband's layouts or as they were eventually would call their layouts so you can learn a lot putting stem lessons into model uh, model train construction and so basically you're going to need to learn